uh, in terms of academic genealogy, genealogy, I guess I'm the academic grandson of uh, George. It so happens coincidentally, my wife also is an academic <laughs> granddaughter of George because she also graduated with Manfred. So in some way, the couple is inbred. <laughs> um, as fate would have it, both me and my wife got offers from MIT also at the time of grad school application, and we both ended up going to Caltech. But in some ways, this is convergence. We are back where we may have been 26 years ago. So it's a pleasure. Um, over the years, George has been a great mentor, friend, um, and even though he was not my advisor, I almost felt like he was my advisor, so I really appreciate it. So this session is on um, product design, and the first speaker is going to be Professor Kaming Ng from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Professor Ng was, I believe, George's um, undergraduate advisee at the University of Minnesota. And George convinced um, Professor Ng to um, move to University of Houston to do a PhD there. He worked in the area of um, oil recovery, tertiary oil recovery. Uh, then Professor Ng joined University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Um, the other connection with George came in 2000 when George was CTO at Mitsubishi Chemical and he invited Professor Ng to come as a uh, scientific advisor, and that's when a number of new technologies in process synthesis and solid liquid processing were developed by Professor Ng with Mitsubishi. Um, among his many accomplishments, he's received the Technological Progress Award from the Japan Petroleum Institute, and right now he's chair professor at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So we look forward to your talk. Okay, uh, George, thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak in front of this uh, audience. Okay, so I will talk about product design, and this is the reason why I moved to Hong Kong, a beautiful place. And uh, the talk has four parts. Each one is short. <laughs> the first part is more personal. I want to begin by... Uh, by sharing with you how George impacted my career. We were together in three separate occasions, as pointed out by um, the, uh, intro, uh, the person who introduced me. In, uh, at that time, in 73 to 74, I was an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota, and George was a young professor at that time. And I still remember two things. One was when he came in and I went to see him. I said, George, I did okay in high school and I did 45 credits in order to skip one year. And I don't know whether he remember or not, he signed on the dotted line. That's why I graduated in three years. <laughs> And then uh, one day when I was a senior, then he again talked to me. He said, well, I have a good friend, an excellent professor at the, U of, at the University of Houston. You should go to work for him. Well, I have never learned to say no to him. So I went. <laughs> and um, then I worked on different aspects of flow in porous media for the next 10 years. But being at UMass with Jim Douglas, I had no choice but to do something about process design. And of course, I went back to George for a second time. So I was at my MIT in 89, and uh, he had a big group working on AI, different things. That really had a big impact on me. That helped consolidate my interest in PSE. And then the third, occasion. As pointed out before, that he was the CTO and I was basically a consultant. We worked on many different technologies, so I was really happy to listen to Tanaka-san, 
to look at all the projects that we talk about. I still remember in March, George told me, okay, come to Yokohama and give a talk on product design. And that opened up my eyes. He showed me and other people in Mitsubishi how to put business first and have never forgotten about that. Now, so he shared his vision at Mitsubishi at the Institute Lecture, along with Ed Kustler, Jimmy Wei, Michael Hill. Basically, George set the development of product design in motion. Now, the motivation for emphasizing product design in around year 2000 is more or less still true today. And we can look at it from the chemical supply chain. Processing is the key. It converts raw material, everything, to consumer products, which are recycled and reused. Now, here we have B2B products, and here we have B2C products. Now, I have been working with, I work at DuPont, I look at all this. You know, for private chemical companies, it is really hard in a, in a, in, in a developed country, uh, economy like the US. Why? There are two reasons. Well, the raw material cost would fluctuate, and there is severe com competition from everywhere. Now, to, and keep in mind, think about ICI, for example. Now, to survive, we have to focus closer to P2C. Why? Because the profit margin would be much higher. And you are not as influenced by the global uh, fluctuations. So, but then we have to have two uh, conditions the entry barriers, and sufficiently large market size for the effort to be worthwhile. Now, specifically, when we want to be closer to the consumer, of course, everyone is thinking about that, but you may not have the marketing channel. Then you can link up with companies that uh, have the marketing channel. For example, the link up between Panasonic and Tesla would be a good example. They manufacture MCA, lithium ion batteries. Now, so we heard from Tanaka san earlier that they, Mitsubishi, uh, create new products that provide comfort and convenience and sustainability both to people over a long period of time. Well, although not articulated as clearly as Tateki, uh, Almost all other chemical companies are doing exactly that. All right? Look at, for example, DuPont. In 2013, they commercialized around 2,000 new products. Take down, they, they launched about 5,000 new products each year. So the, the pressure is on to come up with products that the consumers can use. And of course, we can look up all the way back to the supply chain and see the impact uh, of, of it. Now, so you may think that coming up with new product, okay, just do it. It's not that simple. Uh, it's indeed, it's really, really challenging to come up with successful, profitable products, time in and time out. 5,000 a year, are they all profitable? Why? Because it is challenging because when we talk about B2C products, they are very different. They, they are basically a different animal. We have po different product types. In, they have ingredients and structures. The, the life cycle is short. When you talk about product, then you have to talk to the lawyers, bankers, investment people. And that is what we need to do to make it a success. Now, I still remember that when I took process design from George, we talk about costing the plant. Now we don't talk about that any longer. We have to look at profit. We have to look at new sources of revenue. That's what I learned, all right? But now, for many of the new products that I look into, you are talking about milling granulation, as pointed out by uh, costers, physical vapor deposition. I work with companies 
uh, make uh, uh, okay serving uh, international companies, and that's what they do in uh, inkjet printing everything. So again, as pointed out by Costas, we have to focus on product performance and quality in addition to processing. Now, the difficulty is the knowledge for B2C products is rather fragmented so far. All right. So what can we do? Oh, the reason that I highlighted this, just as a historical note, I took a mass transfer operations from Professor Bill Rands in 1975. All right. That's the book we use by Trebo. We learn about gas, liquid, 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 solid, liquid, and crystallization was the unconventional unit operation in 50 years ago. All right. Now, so since year 2000, uh, oh, a lot of work has been done. And uh, you look at the book by Ed Kessler, by Jimmy Wei, by Wes Lin, and other people. So uh, I, I work with Warren Cedar, and now uh, we have significantly updated product design in our new uh, edition. Now, so now I move on to part three. And because of the limitation of time, I would, uh, uh, I would uh, just present my personal view of product design instead of going over uh, covering everything. Now, so to the approach to product design, by definition, we have to go for multidisciplinary and a hierarchical. Well, uh, the framework has two components. One is the timeline. We have to do product concept conceptualization, detailed design. If we do a good job, then we go forward. This is, turns out to be the key. Very few computer tools can help us to do product conceptualization. You need, uh, cause it needs you and me to think things through. Because we have to look at marketing, we have to understand um, what is going on in society. Basically, we have to go to parties in order to find out what to make and what to uh, sell. Now, the job functions, there are five of them. This is chemical engineering. But we have to understand management, business and marketing, finance and economics. Now, by saying that, I do not mean we have to do what other people do in management, business, and marketing. What I mean is that the chemical engineers have to understand what other professionals can do so that we can do our job in a more effective and efficient way. Now, it is called uh, uh, multidisciplinary because of this. Other people are involved. It is hierarchical because we look at the whole picture and then drill down on the details step by step, all right? Many, many more details that I'm not going to go through uh, today. Now, so then in, to go forward to do product design, we better know what we are talking about, what products are do we mean? We classify, uh, well, by we, I mean uh, by collaborators, uh, chemical product into four different types. The first one is mo a molecule, all right? These are all my uh, research projects, so I have a deep feeling about them. Now, about PVB, we tune the uh, side chain, we tune the molecular weight, and we add nanoparticles to it. Generally, for the safety windshield would only be, will only provide safety. But by doing so, with the, the right adhesion, and with the Leno particles, uh, we can block the IR, we can absorb the sound, so that the auto windshield would perform additional functions. We, uh, we look, look at this uh, molecule, it would emit light under aggregation. Therefore, we use that in biosensor. Well, uh, when I was in at Mitsubishi, we look at fullerenes and Back in Hong Kong, we designed uh, this molecule, which is an electron acceptor used in organic PV. So basically, the difference between chemist and the chemist is that we designed the molecule with a purpose. But I have to add that all of this, I work with the chemist as well. 
I did not do it purely by computer-aided design. All right? So it's a really a combination that would make things work. Now, type 2 is formulated products and is obtained by mixing selected components together. A thin cream can have up to 20 components. Now, so we have to ask the question, with all our thermodynamic database, do we know how to select the ingredients? It has to be stick to your, uh, stick to your skin. It has to film a, form a film. There are many demands. We have never touched the thermodynamics of this type of issues. Now, I, we, uh, we commercialize the dye attached adhesive, and uh, we also design the uh, uh, Lando particle conductive inkjet ink for use in printed electronics. This is the third type. Packaging is a subject that has been picked by Dow as one of the new companies. Now, so functional products, we talk about food packaging, nano zinc oxide used in transparent sunscreen, control release herbicide granules. There are many of them. The fourth type um, is, uh, involves chemical devices. They do it by performing reactions, fluid flow, heating, cooling, so we are no longer talking about a piece of equipment. We are talking about a device. But we are doing basically the same chemical engineering. So in here, uh, we commercialize this humidity sensor. What it is based on the condensation of moisture in the nano pore. This is 100 nano scale here. And these are other examples with water filter. Now, you may say, water filter, I love it, I eat at home. This is a very big business, all right? There are many other new ideas on how to get a newer, more uh, powerful water filter out of what we have, an air uh, purifier. These are big businesses. Now, so in the past uh, five, 10 years, we came up with approaches, procedures, methods, and tools for de designing the four types of uh, products that we, I talk about. So I work with uh, my collaborators, and we look at molecular products, uh, formula products, and so on. These are the procedures, from optimization to experimental work. One thing that I still remember when I was um, at UMass, Jim Douglas told me, how could you imagine that when you design a plant, that you will go out to measure something? Never happens. I can tell you, when you do product design, that is absolutely essential, all right? So we have experiments. Now, take for example, we want to design a formulated product. So you can pick ingredients out of database. Those databases are not available today, all right? Now, but inside a company, we do. Now, and then if we do not find what we want, then we come up with a novel ingredient by doing computer-aided molecular design or to work with a chemist. Then this product can go on in combination with other components to form a device, functional product. That's what we do. And all of these are now being incorporated by uh, my collaborator Rafik Ghani in Denmark in, term, in the form of a computer code. Now, so we have the procedure, but we also have the methods and tools to support the product design procedure. Now, take this. In, we have to have ingredients. We have to select the ingredients and the process. This determines the material properties. And this tool, because it has a product structure, so we did both the material and processing to determine the product structure. In combination, they determine the quality, all right? So we have property model, for example, ICUS from Denmark. We have a process model for unconventional processing techniques. And we have the quality model. Normally, it's not one single criterion. We have product attributes that we have to hit. Then uh, we are here now. That was about, oh, I don't know. We started to work in Amherst, and that was 10 years ago. But we began to ask additional questions. How do you know that the identified product can make a profit? What's the product cost? And how should we charge the customers? That's very important. 
Many people don't worry about it, but pricing is the one of the most important things in product design, all right? Because you can make money or not based on pricing and competition. Now, so does this satisfy consumer preferences, company strategy, and people don't talk about it. But it's equally important to follow government policies and regulations, all right? Because he can stop you from doing something. So now, to, let's, add, let's answer the last question. So for, we look at the company consumer government relationships. Now every company will talk about social responsibility. So for a customer, all he cares about is the product satisfaction. Government would like to use incentives and regulations to improve quality of life, public safety, and the competitiveness of the society. For a company, is making money, all right, and also fulfilling the social responsibility. Now, these issues and all other issues have been captured in what I refer to as a grand product design model. It would help identify the optimal product that satisfies multiple objectives. So it can be economics, uh, corporate, uh, social responsibility, and so on. And these are the models. Now, I do, do not use an eco sign for the reason that what I learned is I have to deliver. I cannot wait to do the modeling. So I use whatever I have at my disposal. So these transform transformation relations are not just equations. They are obtained from model-based methods, rule-based methods. Experience that's, that's calm would help you to make decisions. Databases, tools, and experiments. And that, uh, so uh, with that, we also go beyond now. So you can see we started with this. Now we look at uh, product pricing. We look at co uh, corporate uh, social responsibility, economic analysis, the government policies impacting uh, uh, the decision making. And we look at uh, sustainability and haven't started it yet, but the global supply chain. Okay, so uh, now uh, I'll go to the part four, the vista of product design in 2040. So I stick my neck out and see if I'm right or wrong, probably wrong more likely. So I believe for our future, if we would like to shift somewhat to product design, instead of just doing processing, I believe we have to revamp or at least adjust our curriculum. When we talk about unit op, which I took, instead of distillation extraction, I believe we have to understand better aggregation, breakage, solid formation. But I can tell you, I, I work with uh, uh, Jim or Douglas on solid processing. After 10 years, I think the progress is still pretty slow. For design, we have to look at beyond process, but product synthesis and simulation, particularly those related to biomaterials and sustainability. Now, I can tell you that uh, George looked at this problem with uh, Richard. This is still his, his infancy. How to predict product structure is really, really hard problem. Now, instead of for transport phenomena, I think that all we need basically is the new BSL, more focusing on product design. All right, that's all we need. For mathematics, now, I remember that I also took my math from Emerson and you know, those people. Rather than just talking about solving equations, I think it's very essential to look at how to use the tools, because otherwise it's too long, it's too far away, all right? So clearly PSD is, is heading in the right direction, but I also feel good because we have been using CFD, ComSoft, even now for undergraduate teaching. Thermodynamics. Well, we have been teaching excess Gibbs free energy, gamma fry for phase equilibria. But for product design, we have to predict properties that are really essential. 
all right, for product adhesion, wettability, UV absorption, we are far behind. We are not there yet, all right? So there are many opportunities in formulation science. So if we can, if we succeed in doing what I just said, I believe, I'm sticking my neck out, and uh, also using Tim Douglas' statement that our profession really depends on the bachelor's degree graduates, all right? So I believe that if we do that, they would have a broad, broader outlook, entrepreneurship, and they are more likely to engage in market sec sectors other than petrochemical. And the world is opening up, and I believe that will happen. They will actively participate in product formulation and will operate plants with unconventional processing. Now, many will, in, will be involved in designing products that can be sustained. I look at that problem. Take lithium-ion battery as an example. Today, we use an organic binder, PVDF. I look at the recycle. Now, you know, every tester has 700 pounds of lithium-ion battery in it. So we have to recycle it because of the fact that the way they design the product without thinking about sustainability, they use an organic binder. I can tell you, if you use an aqueous binder, the job would be a whole lot, whole lot easier. All right? So we have to look ahead at, uh, of, of the life cycle. They will contribute more directly to meeting society needs, comfort and convenience for customers and uh, CSR. Now, uh, I still remember Iglacio mentioned one day uh, that, okay, many of our new chemical engineering faculty members, they are in basic sciences. Some do not bother to attend AICG meeting. Right? I believe the product design will help integrate all these people because that would be now our new platform, our new foundation, and propel chemical engineering to a new height, and hopefully with new textbooks other than the one by Trebo. Okay, with that then, uh, I stop here. And uh, George, this is my final design report to you. And uh, all the best. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions, short questions. If you can use the mic. Uh, hello, my name is Arif. Um, I'm a student in chemical engineering and will be graduating this year. So uh, my question is, um, now that I have just like completed four or five years of like study in chemical engineering. But now I am like more interested in product design, product development, marketing, business, and so forth. What are like some of the practical steps that you recommend to me and my colleagues who are interested in, in um, how I say, in, in um, entrepreneurship and this kind of domain? Okay, that's a, uh, that's a fair question. I just talked to my daughter, my former colleague, that now I'm, very, I'm involved in working with companies, looking at how to invest in companies, uh, acquisition, and so on. And um, I think uh, the best bet is that if you are interested, get a degree that, uh, or master's or whatever, that would help you to have a solid technical background. And then you can go beyond it. But uh, it may sound easy. People in finance, they make a lot of money, but not everybody. So I think my best advice is have a solid technical background and then look beyond that point. Question. Any other question? Quick question. Okay. Uh, would I repeat your Thank question? Her. I'm not supposed to ask. <laughs> but uh, what I wanted was not to really ask you a question, only to relate to you a story that happened to me in the last uh, week. Uh, one of uh, my younger colleagues in the department uh, 
uh, has been curious about the excitement of the undergraduate chemical engineering students. He does not see them as excited as those in mechanical engineering who do the robots and they do the flying machines and uh, all the sorts of things. And he is playing with new ideas. That they are chemical engineering, I was astounded by what he brings forth to discuss. Uh, and I'm going to be a little bit oblique about the description, not to tell you who he is. But uh, he has started a new initiative in our department, uh, which I find to be very, very exciting to the students. So, he comes to me the other day and he says, George, I have an idea that I want to change completely the Introduction to Chemical Engineering book. It's not going to be just material and energy balances, although I realize they do have a significant role to play. But look at the kinetics, look at the thermodynamic equilibria, look at the molecular phenomena in product design. How do you bring this? And he laid out for me something that made perfect sense. So I said, to go to work. Get the detailed table of contents with a small paragraph of what you will be teaching and how you will be connecting it to high school stuff. What I wanted to say is that uh, you see this person who has never been in process systems engineering, that's the important thing, is coming to a realization that requires a rethinking of the curriculum with very early entry of concepts that he is learning from process systems engineering. And we should encourage that. We don't know what's going to come out of it, but that's how you do experiments, you move things forward. So, people are thinking, so hopefully your suggestion will be materialized by someone. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank the speaker. Okay, continuing on this um, product uh, design and product optimization discussion, our next speaker is Dr. Kevin Joback. Um, uh, Kevin, uh, as I understand, was George's first um, student coming into his group when George moved to MIT, but he tells me he was not the first student who graduated um, <laughs> from, from that first batch. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree at Stevens, uh, and he did his master's with uh, Professor Reed. Uh, he developed a method at that time, which is now called the Joback method, uh, which is based on group contribution uh, approach to estimating thermophysical properties. At MIT, since he was one of the early students, um, he um, helped set up the laboratory for intelligent systems and process engineering. Uh, and subsequently worked on symbolic LISP computers um, for designing molecules. So that's kind of the theme of this session. Um, he, after his graduation, um, um, set up a company called Molecular Knowledge Systems, where he's still the president of the company. Um, he has guided a number of chemical companies to develop new products. Um, one of the awards which um, I'm aware of is he got the Praxair New Helium Application Award for a new application that they found for the molecule helium, I guess, or, or they can find. Uh, the two flagship um, packages from the company are Cranium and Synapse. Um, and they've been used in many chemical companies for product design. So we'll continue this discussion of product design with Kevin Stock. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I have to tell you, as you'll see in the talk, it's wonderful to be part of a session on chemical product design. Since when we did it many years ago, we had to explain what on earth that, that meant. Um, and along those lines, a long time ago, as it was said, um, I was here at MIT, and I did a thesis with George from 1984 to 1989, wasn't the first one out, um, designing molecules possessing desired physical properties. What I'm thrilled by also is these are part of the group. When George came, he put together a, a, a bunch of new students. 
And what was intriguing was um, people have mentioned how George likes to look at, at visionary things. And the projects we were assigned, our, our PhD theses, were very visionary. We didn't know that. We thought it was like, hey, this is what everybody else is doing. So it was, it was a fun opportunity to look very far. It was also, um, I should mention one other thing. I actually came to MIT in 1982. I did a master's thesis with Bob Reed. And when I finished that master's thesis, I was done. I said, I'm leaving. That was enough. That's all I wanted. That's all I came for. Never had an intention of getting a PhD. Bob Reed mentioned to me, he said, there's a professor coming to give a lecture. He's, not, he's going to be joining the department later in the year. He said, I think you should go hear him. And George came, gave a lecture, and part of the lecture was designing reactions and such. I was thrilled. I talked to him later on, and he said, would you like to continue working in this area? So I've always said, I said yes. And so the point was, I actually never intended to get a PhD, or never wanted to get a PhD. I just wanted to continue working in this area. So I thank you very much for that. 1984, 1980s was a, a revolutionary time. We were looking at the group, how to apply new computer techniques or new computer technology, especially artificial intelligence, to solve all kinds of problems. The thing that was really interesting, and we didn't quite know this at the time, there was an incredible revolution going on. This is a, a data general machine, which used to be down in the basement. We went from these machines during that time to what we called workstations. This is a list machine, 3640. This is the second generation list machine. The first one was the size of a refrigerator. And then some amazing thing happened. IBM 286s came out. And suddenly this personal computer. The intriguing thing was the processing power kept intensifying. So it was processing intensification. And we were starting to get more and more powerful machines. And the revolution has just continued with computational capabilities that's just unimaginable. So I kind of thought about that. And I said, if we're thinking about what the process systems engineering is going to be like, I have a feeling it may follow the same path. Say in 20 years, the way chemical products are made will change dramatically. In essence, comparing the chemical plants of today with those of 2040 is like comparing a data general mainframe to a smartphone. I think we're really at that point in time where we're going to have major changes. And just as was said before, Really, the market for personalized chemical products, that's going to be main driving force for this change. So I mentioned chemical products, and we've mentioned it before. Uh, I just want to go into that a little bit. Uh, people were talking about interest in chemical products. Here's one. Gillette Fusion. The intriguing thing about this is it's not just a product. You can think of it as an entire process. I don't know if people know how this works. It's a pressurized container. So when you press the valve, which by the way is the valves used in chemical products are probably the most common valves on earth. The pumps used when you apply your hand, uh, hand soap, many more times than any other kind of pump. But if you look, do chemical engineer professors ever teach about those valves and those pumps? No. We have centrifugal pumps and such, but never valves and pumps that go into products. Anyhow, these are the ingredients in here. And as you can see, it may look a little complicated, but if you think of what's going on in here, it all makes sense. The first thing, it's under pressure. The pressure pushes out a simple flow problem, pushes out the uh, gel onto your hand. The gel contains a certain... Uh, set of propellants. These propellants actually evaporate. And then we smear it onto a, a surface, which causes the propellants to evaporate more. So although there's many, many interesting ingredients, at least in this formulation, they make sense. And it was asked before, if chemical engineers are interested in products, should they be? And I say they should. 
Not only should they be interested in products, they have to be interested in products. Oh. Let's just go through this. If you take your product, don't do this at home. It says on the can, do not puncture. This is a little more than puncturing. If you open up that product, this is what's called bag on valve technology. It's a small bag that contains the gel. Surrounding the bag is pressurized nitrogen. As you push the valve, the nitrogen expands, forcing the gel out. If you take ideal gas law, combine it with just a simple flow equation, what happens? As the gas expands, pressure drops. That's why the main complaint for gel systems is what? You pay a lot for this, and all of a sudden you think it's not all coming out. Pressure hasn't, basically, the pressure's dropped too much, and the flow rate's dropped too much. If you look at the gel when it comes out, this is now a thickened liquid. It's mostly water. There's a key thing in chemical products, key rule of thumb. Put as much water as you can in your product. Sell as much water if you can. If you can sell 100% water, you're golden. That's good. So this is about 80% water at times. It's thickened with polymers. If we go back, you have certain polymers that thicken up the water. You have emulsifiers. The emulsifiers, if you notice, right here, we have isopentane, isobutane. Isopentane, isobutane is a hydrocarbon. We have mostly water. They don't mix. We make an emulsion. The isobutane, isopentane is inside your little drop. When it comes out, it's a nice thick solution, a nice thick emulsion. We spread that on our face. The intriguing thing is if you go back to fluid mechanics, you look up lubrication theory, you plug in the force you apply to your face, you plug in all the material properties, you get the right thickness. The chemical engineering works. It'll tell you how thick you apply this to your face. The next thing is quite interesting. Isobutane, isopentane, that's emulsified. Once it gets on your face, what happens? Well, roughly, there's a few other components we mix in. But if you have about 80% isopentane, as it comes out, it's still in the liquid phase, assuming it's at room temperature. Once it gets onto your skin, the heat transfer boils that liquid. So you're vaporizing the isobutane, isopentane mix mixture on your face. That's what makes the foam. So again, basic chemical engineering helps you make these products. And in general, that's the idea. Over the years and today, we're accumulating a tremendous amount of knowledge. Much of this knowledge that's needed to design an incredible variety of things. And these chemical products, we're not just designing if it's going to be a solvent. We're not designing if it's going to dry fast. We want to design how it feels on the skin. We want to design what color is it as it evaporates, as it dries. Will it stick to the paper if I make white out and bend the paper? Will there be adhesion there? All these things, we're getting pretty good models for now. We're not going to plug it in and get one answer, but it provides insight, just like old time engineers. These are chemical products, but one of the things I wanted to talk about, especially in the context of process systems engineering, we're going to come up with many, many products. How do we make this? How do we make all of these? Well, traditionally, we build nice, big, optimized, simulated, tested, validated chemical plants. And we take all these chemicals, all this, sorry, this large amount of chemical, and distribute it. We distribute it to all kinds of products. And if you think about it, how do we use chemical products and what volume? I mean, imagine the entire paint industry is enormous. But how much paint? 40 microns on a wall? We use chemical products actually in small amounts although we decide to build it, or we construct them in large chemical plants. What's happening today is people are starting to say, do we really need these big chemical plants? Maybe we could have lots of little chemical plants. This is the area 
process intensification. I don't know anything about this. But I hear people and they say, this is wonderful. We can have all these complicated you know, multi-unit uh, operations in one operation, in one unit. OK, I guess, if you'd like. Um, but the idea is still almost the same. I don't really care what's inside here. It's still the same idea. We're going to have this big chemical plant made of lots of little pieces that's going to produce a lot of chemicals and ship it out. Uh, what was intriguing is I was at a lecture, or I was at a conference once, and someone was talking about process intensification, and there were people from industry. And the old engineers said, there is no way lots of little units is going to match the efficiency of one big unit. It just doesn't work. He said, if we have, a, and they said, even how are you going to get the volume? He said, what if you had, you know, make 10 of these or 100 of these? And I sat there and I said, he's, I think, missing the point. We're not going to replace the chemical plant with lots of little ones, just like we didn't replace the mainframe with a room full of PCs. We replaced the mainframe whoops, with millions of PCs, not in that room, but distributed. So we talked about sticking your neck out. Here's my predictions. <laughs> the same way that we went from computers from mainframe to distributed personal computers. You can imagine the idea that we're going from this large chemical plant to millions of distributed little chemical plants. Now, somebody would say, well, why, would, why would I do that? Why would I want a chemical plant in my house? That was the same comment or question asked to Tom Watson of IBM. Or his comment was, he could not imagine how anyone would ever want a computer in their house. Now, people take that quote incorrectly. You have to remember what a computer was when he made that quote. It was this enormous machine. It would take up your entire house. It would consume an immense amount of power. It needed specialized care, specialized maintenance, experts to operate it. That's what a computer was. Possible analogy. But computing evolved to where we have a system. You have a simple cell phone you know, or smartphone. You don't think much about it. It works very well. Can we do the same thing with chemical plants? Can we have a house or, let's say, your local store have a chemical plant that can make all kinds of chemical products? The intriguing thing is this is starting to happen. And is it going to catch on? Why did personal computers catch on? They were neat. We took them apart, put them together. It's fun. But we started ending up with killer apps. The killer apps, at least for us, was word processing, especially when you had to type a thesis. Next thing, email. We started having killer apps. So are there any killer apps? Are there is anything coming out in this area? One of the killer apps people talk about, 3D printing. The idea that you're going to be able to make products, little devices, a gear breaks here and there on your garage door opener. You find the plans and have it made. It's very nice. The intriguing thing is there are companies today uh, if you look at polymer resin companies, they're already selling polymer resin grades specifically for 3D printing. And 3D printing, this you can get at Walmart. I forget, I think it's under $1,000. Kind of reminds me of the laser printers of old. Um, inkjet printing for electronics and other things uh, is happening very quickly. It's an interesting thing. You can print, oops, you can print circuitry, simple circuitry right now, but we're actually working on interesting applications to increase the resolution. So you'll be able to print very high density circuitry. Another area that's quite interesting, again, that's happening today, personalized cosmetics. I love this product, or this process, actually. Uh, cosmetic foundation, it's used mostly by, by I have to say, human females. Uh, the idea is that our skin is not uniform, and so society says it's nice to have uniform skin. 
that's okay. People buy it, we'll make it. So the idea is, if you ever go to the store, they have a variety of shades. Well, none ever matches perfectly the person. So Lancome came up with a wonderful process. You go in, you have your skin measured. The color, it's a field called colorimetry. It's a wonderful area for property estimation. You can actually estimate the color. You make a mix of chemicals, I can tell you what color it's going to be. And it works quite well. They measure their skin in the store. I apologize, it's a little dark. They make the product right there. For the most part, cosmetic foundation, if you think about it, uh, were mainly shades of different amounts of red and brown. Uh, so if you take iron oxides, different iron oxides would give you the reddish and the brown. If you take titanium dioxide, that gives you the white. We can make all the shades we need. That's what this machine is doing. The thing that I like most, this is, um, they mentioned here to protect against oxidation, maintain color accuracy. They have eight uh, peristolic pumps. If you ever designed a process with eight peristolic pumps, can you imagine what it would cost? I mean, if you look at all the typical metrics we use as a chemical engineer, we're saying this is an awful design. The intriguing thing is they're using it for marketing. They're saying it's a tremendous design. Look at the effort we put into our process. So it may change the way we think about how we design things. Um, but for the most part, you go to the store, they measure the skin color, tailor-made, and you walk home with your own personalized product. And the one area that I thought is interesting, actually I knew a landscaper who said he was doing this, which got me very scared. <laughs> but for a long time, you can have, again, your own biofuel. People walk around, they'll get waste cooking oil, it's again, triglycerides. You go through your inverse transesterification. You basically break your triglycerides up, fatty acids, neutralize the fatty acids with a simple base, and you get fatty alcohols or you get fatty esters. And that makes a very nice beginning diesel fuel. You think about diesel fuel, we have to add a number of things, especially today, lubricants and so forth. But you can buy these for a couple thousand dollars. And what I would like to do I live up in New Hampshire. Used vegetable oil is nice. Every fall, it would be really nice for me to take all my leaves and put it into a vise and have it chew it up and actually get some fuel out of it. So hopefully the next generation of these devices will work much better. So the idea is that this personalized chemical uh, products are going to drive real innovations. I think we may, there'll still be big chemical plants for certain things, but we're going to see more and more of these small chemical plants come up. What does that mean if you're a process engineer? Well, first thing I always like to say, we talk about a chemical plant that makes commodity products. We're gonna to have to start thinking of the chemical plant itself as the commodity product. We're going to make hundreds, thousands of these things. Uh, and people may say that's immensely complicated. If you ever want to build a smartphone, just even from a materials point of view, it's also immensely complicated, and it's done. Uh, think in terms of appliances. We have refrigerators, washing machines, dishwashers. People are saying you're going to have a 3D printer soon. You're going to basically have, I don't have a name for this yet, but your personalized chemical process there. Uh, Issues. It has to be environmentally, whatever we make. We have to build in environmental compatibility. We're not going to have people coming around to each house. We're going to have to dispose of the material. We have to design so that it can be disposed of. And, uh, control. We heard a lot about control. Intriguing thing now, we don't have the luxury of basically, if we make a mistake as we're filling a thousand gallon tank, we have some time to adjust. If I said I'm going to be making two cc's, how good is my control system? Especially if that two cc's is going to be mixed in a certain way and put on someone's face. Different design objectives, like I said, optimizing for lowest cost. I don't know. Is my lawnmower optimized for lowest cost? Kind of looked good to me. It seemed to work. 
low maintenance, robust operation, and the last one is the most important, inherent safety. When I was here at MIT, it was, I had a wonderful opportunity to courses on entrepreneurship, and we had the lecture by the founder of Cuisinart. Uh, everybody knows Cuisinart, you use it in your kitchen, it grinds immensely. That came from an industrial unit used, again, in, in uh, rest, large restaurants and food processing areas. The main issue they had was, how do you take this industrial grinder and say, I'm going to put this in everybody's house? And they worked forever on trying to make it inherently safe so that you could not open it, that it would not break, the blades would not come off. We may have to think at a whole different level of how do we make a chemical plant inherently safe to inexperienced or worse kinds of users. So with that, that was my idea. And as I said before, process systems engineers, we now have a wonderful opportunity to design a whole new generation of chemical plants. A new generation that will produce numerous personalized chemical products. Uh, we'll see if we step up to that challenge. Uh, I should also mention, personally, I've truly enjoyed living through the computer revolution. At MIT, I missed it. We had our list machines. It was eye-opening to me. As an undergraduate, I was really good at programming Fortran. And I was really good at getting numbers out. And then all of a sudden, we're going to design molecules? I don't even know what that means. You know, I mean, the notion that a computer could give you anything except a number was so foreign to me, foreign to most of us. So it was a tremendous, I guess, intellectual expansion to see what computations could be done. I'm hoping that I get to see this next revolution in the chemical process area. Uh, it's going to be a very exciting path. And as I said, I have to thank George for helping me get along that path. Uh, setting me on that path, actually, quite a long time ago. So with that, George, thank you very much. And I thank you all. Questions? If you can grab a microphone. Thank you very much, Kevin, for this uh, nice talk. If you don't mind going back one slide to 16. And, sorry, my name is Ali Abbas from University of Sydney, Australia. So here you have some objectives for product design in terms of environmental compatibility, control, low maintenance and robust operation and so on. So if we make products along this, these types of objectives, we're going to not have business investing in new, you know, in, in this, because we're going to have very robust products Long life products. Sure. So, what's your insights from the? This is always a good question. So, the, you know, the question comes down to: if we make a better product, it lasts longer. What if it lasts forever? We sell one one copy of it, we're done. Um, it's always you know every situation is different. But I remember um, R and D, uh, head of R and D at, at Xerox. Uh, they had a wonderful idea. If you look at how uh, toner works. Basically, you have a little toner particle. By electrostatic means, you stick it on to a certain location on your paper, and you heat it up, and it melts. They had a wonderful idea, and they worked it out, where if you take your toner particle, and you adhere wax to it, what happens is the wax will melt first. You look at the surface tension differences. And the toner will actually adhere on top of the wax. And because it doesn't sink in, and because the wax is cheap, you actually can use less toner, and you can, you can get the cost down. And he remembers the day, I remember telling the story, he walked into Xerox management, and he says, I have a great idea. We're going to be able to sell much less toner. <laughs> and they were like, why is that a great idea? And it took a while. But it convinced them that if it's not so much selling less toner, and you've heard this before, the customer experience becomes so much better that instead of saying, I don't want to print anything because it costs so much, now you said, it doesn't cost as much, so I'll actually print more. And so toner sales actually went up because now the customer was getting better value for buying your product. 
And so those are the opportunities. If you sit there and say, I make a better product, will people use it more? Will people buy more of it? And in those situations, that's where you see the money, basically. And you satisfy your computers, I'm sorry, your customers' needs, which is wonderful. So it doesn't always work, uh, but for the most part, coming out with new products, you know, replacing old ones, that's what we do all the time. We always like that. Good. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Kevin once again for a great thank talk. Thank you very much. So in a way, this is a nice segue to the next talk. Actually, um, much of the slides, the way they were presented, were about process intensification, safety, making a chemical plant um, uh, for distributed manufacturing. And it kind of is a segue to microchemical plants or microreactors, which were sort of the vision for doing this um, in, in some fashion. So. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Shinji Hashibi. Um, uh, from my notes, I guess I know that George met um, Professor Hashibi in 1982 for the first time um, at the PSC conference in Kyoto. And since then, they have been interacting with each other for the last uh, 35 years in a variety of um, uh, relationship, both in research and education. Professor Hashibi received all his degrees, BS, MS, uh, MEng, PhD, from Kyoto University, and he's been there on the Faculty of Chemical Engineering at Kyoto since uh, 1981. Since 2003, he's a, a full professor. He's a board member of the Society of Chemical Engineers in Japan, and also the Institute of Systems Control and Information Engineering. His research interests are mainly in the area of um, microchemical systems, microreactors, but he also works in the area of ecological processes and uh, supply chain management. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Mayresh. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my great honor to uh, talk in such a memorial symposium. And first of all, congratulations, George, for the 70th uh, birthday and happy retirement. OK, but my talk today is design and control of microchemical plant. But uh, as mentioned by Mayresh, and I first met George at the first international symposium on process system engineering, which was held in Kyoto, 1982. It, it is also the very and uh, spoke, uh, spoke making and uh, symposium. And in this symposium, we have 15 keynote speakers. Most of the keynote speakers uh, established the professors, but this the my. Uh, supervisor, Iori Hashimoto, selected several very young uh, active researchers. Uh, George was at that time uh, one of them. Maybe he, uh, you were 35 years old at that time. And also the, uh, uh, Manfred and Ignacio also the, participated in this symposium. <laughs> OK, my talk consists of three parts. First part is why I'm interested in the microchemical systems. And this is also the memorial uh, issue of CEP, uh, January's issue of 2000. And in this issue, the Professor Stankovich uh, mentioned about the micro system. Uh, he uh, showed us many uh, beneficial points of micro systems, and he said, the microsystem is a key component of the process intensification. At that time, uh, I was also interested in the microsystem. The reason is that 
we are always discussing with Iori Hashimoto that what is the future direction of the chemical industries. We thought that no one doubt that the production of low volume and high value added products is a future direction. And in order to produce such kind of product, we usually use this kind of batch processes. Batch process is better than the continuous process for the production of to, for, to produce the material with um, precise control of temperature for patterns and residence time and so on. However, suppose a case, if we want to mix A and B within one second and heat up to 400 Kelvin within two seconds and keep the temperature at 400 seconds for five seconds, uh, Kelvin for five seconds, and then cool down to 30, 300 Kelvin within one second for terminating the operation. How can we operate this kind of the batch process? It is difficult. I suppose the most of the chemists cannot imagine that this kind of operation because chemists did not have the concept of the residence time. Now the situation is changing that they are very interested in the flow chemistry, but even so, it is difficult to operate this kind of the process by using the batch processes. Then we consider the microchemical plants. What is, why the microchemical plant is good for such kind of operation. The key issue is, the, this one, key feature is a large surface volume ratio. By decreasing the size of the device, surface volume ratio increases. So this is very if, good for the heat transfer through the wall. So by using the, this feature, we can precisely control the temperature and pre change the temperature very, very, uh, very rapidly. This is a very simple uh, heat balance equation of the tubular heat exchangers. If for the case of steady state, this equation becomes like this. And I always ask my student to solve the, this uh, equation for these two cases to identify the effect of large surface to volume ratio. One case is in the diameter is 25 millimeters, one inch, one inch tubes. The other case is the in the diameter is 0 0.25 millimeters. The length is one meters and the feed is boiling water and the feed velocity is 0 0.1 meter per second. It is easy to solve this equation. The result is this, and adding the, these parameters to, the, to this part, we can get for case one, uh, this is uh, this one, for case two, and uh, this one. And this can be shown in the graphs. For the case of the device A, temperature change like this. At the end of the device, it is almost the 80 degrees Celsius. How about the case B? It changed like this. In, in this case, velocity is 0 0.1 meter per second. So in this point, it need, we need one second. So within one second, temperature is almost the same as that in the wall. This is the power of the large surface to volume ratio. So usually for the highly exothermic reaction, this kind of hot spot occurs. To avoid such kind of hot spot, we operate at low temperatures, for example, minus 30 degrees Celsius or minus 80 degrees Celsius, or dilute reactant with solvent, or feed reactant slowly, dropped into the bottom, into the vessels. All of these operations artificially slow down the reaction rate to avoid this kind of hot spot. But 
If we can use micro-reactors as a result of large surface volume ratio, we can control this kind of, uh, of the situations. As a, and the other characteristics of micro-reaction and uh, micro-device is rapid mixing, but the time is limited, and we ha I have 35 slides, so I skip this slide. And second, a third one is resin time control. I mentioned only one point. My colleague, the Professor Yoshida in Kyoto University, said that it is now possible to control the resin time at one millisecond. If we can control the resin time of 0.1 millisecond, he said the, and the chemistry may be changed. Because if we can control the 0.1 millisecond, we can control the logical de reactions. But uh, now it is still difficult, he said. But anyway, we can now control the resin time of zero, 1 millisecond, so we can handle the unstable uh, intermediate in this kind of microsystems. Okay, so I explained that there are many uh, beneficial points in the microsystems. However, in order to use these characteristics efficiently, to it, new design and operation procedures are requested. So I'd like to explain what is the difference between the design of conventional process and microprocess. Last 30 or 50 years, we have rapid progress in chemistry and chemical engineering science. But unfortunately, this result is not used in the design of the conventional uh, devices, conventional, conventional unit operations. We still use the RAM parameter system, or we use the over, overall heat transfer coefficient, perfect mixing, plug flows, and so on. This is because we, it is still difficult to make a precise model. Suppose the case of the catalytic reactions. And the catalyst is in, embedded into the reactors, and reactant is goes through them around the this kind of the, uh, the channels. In this case, it's very difficult to make a, mo a precise model in this, this kind of the react uh, reactors. However, if we use, we use a very tiny thin tubes and the uh, catalyst is coated on the wall, we can, uh, we can achieve the very uniform flows into the reactors. In this case, we can make the precise model of this kind of reaction, reactors. And if we can make the precise model, we can optimize the shape or characteristics of this kind of reactions. So, for the case of the microsystems, the flow becomes a very regular, so it is possible to make the precise model so this is a slide I explained and in the PSC meeting of 2003, but I still have the, the same motivation of the, this slide. Now, we want to make the precise model of the, the conventional very big plant, but it is very difficult. So first step is to make the precise model of the microchemical plant and optimize the uh, plant uh, structures in this part. Then we go to the display. What is the difference between the conventional plant and microsystems? In the conventional design problem, each unit operation is modeled as a ramped parameter system. So the design variables are size and volume of the devices. But for the case of the microchemical systems, suppose the case of mixing the two kinds of materials. Here, we must carefully design this part. The design of this part affects the performance of the mixing. 
when we want to distribute the one stream to the five streams, we must carefully design this part. Otherwise, the flow rate of the, it, it, the, these channels becomes the, not the uniform. If we want to change the temperature like this, we must also carefully design the shape of the, this uh, tubes. It means that shape is a, the very important design variable for the case of this kind of microsystems. It is a most, uh, very important point and, and large difference between the conventional uh, chemical process and microsystems. This is the tubes of conventional reactors. It is a channel of micro reactors. It is difficult to make this kind of tubes. It is strange. But it is not strange to, to make this kind of channels. It is not difficult to make this kind of channel. So we can change the width of the channel. And also now we can use the 3D printers and it is very easy to make this kind of the devices. And this is an example of highly exothermic reactions. Suppose the case we must design a micro devices so that the temperature in the reactor is constant. This graph shows, shows the amount of heat generated in the unit time. So in, the, in, the, in, the, in that part, a uh, large amount of heat is generated, and at the, and the after that part, the amount of heat generated is very small. How should we design this kind of uh, situations? We know surface area per unit volume can be changed by changing the, the diameters. So we can change the uh, surface per unit amount of volumes. So by changing the, the diameter, place by place, it is possible to keep the temperature constant. This is an example. Suppose the case of the conventional straight channels, the temperature changes like this. But if we optimize the, the width of the channels, the temperature is almost the same on the, all of the places, even in the very highly exothermic reactions. And next point is the control problem of the micro devices. And th this is an example of the micro devices, and we want to keep the temperature on the flow rate of each channel. But it is very difficult because the measuring instruments and uh, actuators cannot be installed in it. Because maybe in many cases, the actuator or the sensor is larger than the channel width or channel size. So we need the new, new ideas or concept of control of such kind of the micro devices. This is an example of the, the conventional control system. There are three micro channels. We want to control the temperature of the out, outer part of the reactant, and also we want to control the flow rate of each channel. In this case, we need the three temperature controllers and the three uh, flow rate controllers. But if we, the number of the channel increases, we need a large number of the controllers. So how about this case? We do not control the temperature of the, the reactant itself, but the, control the temperature of cooling waters. And we do not control the flow rate of each channel but to control the total flow rate. If we can control, implicitly control the temperature and the flow rate by using this system, we can reduce the number of the controllers and also there's no controllers in, this, in the device. We can say that it is, we ensure the process condition not by control but the process design. But of course, in order to keep the uh, uniform flow rate of these three channels, we must carefully design uh, this part. Also, 
we must carefully decide the tube length and the tube diameter so as to control the temperature of this part. The design of micro devices, we, I, I mentioned that the shape is the very important design variables. And this is one example of the design of the micro channels. It is a case of the parallelized micro channels. In this case, in order to keep the uniform flow rate of these 20 channels, we must carefully design the, this the manifold section. And this is stacked like this. In this case, reactant A comes here and distributes to here and go down and here. Reactant B comes here and go here and go up and mix this point and reaction occurred in this channel and product is withdrawn through this, this line. And cooling water is, uh, is um, fed to the, these two panels and to keep the uh, temperature constant. In this case, shape of mixing uh, point is, must be optimized and current temperature is kept constant by large flow rate of current. Uh, temperature of the reactant are uh, implicitly controlled by controlling the current temperature and flow rate of each channel is implicitly controlled by proper design of the manifold. So, in this case, the controlling uh, me mechanisms, me controlling mechanisms uh, embedded as a shape of the device. Okay, so to develop the design procedure of the micro devices, these mechanisms must be made clear in advance and included into the model. This is very important to design this kind of system. Okay, now I'd like to move to the uh, final uh, point of contribution of the PSE to the design and control of this kind of microchemical systems. I mentioned that there's some point here, design with the shape optimization and so on, but there are still many problems which must be solved by process systems engineers. But the time is limited. I just mentioned all these three points. First one is uh, microchemical plants are appropriate, appropriate tool for process system engineer to verify our ideas. What does this, does this mean is that we, we have proposed many new design and, and or control procedures to the, to the industrial people. But unfortunately, we do not have the real plant in the lab. And so the real application depends on the mind of industrial people. And industrial people usually say that, oh, real plant is different from the model. So we cannot accept your ideas. Now, we can design, and construct, and operate the plant by ourselves. Of course, in, in our laboratory, we have the micro, micro plants. We can operate it. Now, in the near future, we can use the 3D printers to construct the very precise uh, micro reaction systems. So in that case, it is more much easier to uh, in, uh, introduce uh, this kind of micro plant into the lab. In this system, we can verify the, our results of uh, design and control. Someone said, oh, your proposal is true only for the, your pro the proposed model. Yes, my uh, result is true only the, only the model, but we can construct the plant which is the same as the model. Oh, there arises many unforeseen problems in the real operation. Yes, but we propose operation that does not generate disturbances. Or even if such kind of unforeseen problem occurs, we design, we, I, we design the plant with enough robustness. We can verify this kind of things by our plant. 
it's, it's a, I think it's a very important point. The second one is self-control mechanism and robust design. We, if we can use a very precise model, we, in, in the design, we add this kind of mechanism in it. So, suppose a case, uh, the output is a function of the input and some disturbance. If we make this, the, we change the shape and the structure of the plant, and we can get a, this kind of the situation. In this case, even is, if the disturbance is changed, it is, does not affect the output. Or the other point is we can embedding the feedback mechanisms into the device. You know the centrifugal governors in this one, it is mechanically controlled the, the flow rate of steam flow rate into the, into the turbine. If we consider that this kind of concept into the micro device, it becomes a very robust one. Suppose a case, we have many building blocks, flow channels, reactor channels, splitters, mixers, heat suppliers, pumps, and so on. By using the, these building blocks, we optimize the design of structure, size, and shapes. For example, we put this one, we can get this kind of structure. But in addition to the, this kind of the devices, if we can have the, the temperature sensitive channels or pressure sensitive channels, we can use the, this kind of channels as a feedback controller. If the, if the temperature becomes high, the channels are shrinking or expansion, expanding, or pressure is, becomes high, the channels are shrinking or channels expanding. If this kind of mechanism is, is we can get this kind of devices, we put this device into the here, we can add the feedback mechanism into the system. So the, I suppose finally the problem is the superstructure-based optimization problem. It is maybe the MINLP. And maybe it is not enough. We need the process knowledge. We must add the process knowledge. And also, we need the knowledge acquisition by using the AI. Last one is a reconstruction of the conventional unit operations. Why is the distribution column so tall? It is because there consists of many stages, and each stage consists of the 60 or 100 centimeters. So if we have the, the 30 stages, 30 trays, the height is more than uh, 30 or 40 meters. But why does each stage need 60 to 100 centimeters? If the vapor space velocity is 1.0 meter per second. And if the each bubbles can become the equilibrium with the liquid within 0.01 second, each tray needs only the one centimeters. And, and if the vapor beta part is the same, and so in this case, the each tray needs two centimeters. So the 30 trays mean the 60 centimeters. So if we can find a structure that satisfies this condition, the solution column can be become like this. And we can put the distillation column into the, uh, can combine into the micro reaction systems. Okay, so the, now I mentioned that we can, uh, it, for the case of microsystems, we can make a very precise model. So by using this precise model, we, do, 
We optimization without hardware constraint. We can do the optimization, optimize the process without consider, consider the hardware constraint. After the result is obtained, we create a new hardware structure. By using the, these steps, we can, there are some possibility to generate a new unit operation or new structures of devices. And microsystems have potential to realize this kind of design schemes, I think. Okay, and this is uh, the end of my presentation. And finally, I thank George again for and because he always gave me a very uh, good uh, suggestion for my research. And also now uh, he, are very, uh, he supported the education of the Kyoto University uh, chem uh, Department of Chemical Engineering. Thank you very much. Time for questions. They are hungry. <laughs> Shinji, you, you mentioned the surface to volume increase as we go to lower and lower diameters, um, which of course increases heat transfer. Um, is there a counter effect though, because the flow goes from turbulent to lamina inside, so we have less heat transfer, and also we have a um, temperature gradient across the radius of the reactor? Yeah, the, when, the, you know, the uh, the, the temperature change is very fast compared with the, the composition change by diffusion. But when we make, usually the temperature dif change by diffusion is ten times faster than the, the component the diffusion. So the, maybe the, 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 that kind of the temperature change is not a big, very big problem in many cases. We, we can assume the temperature is almost the same, if, even if we have the, uh, the flow distribution uh, and in, the, in the laminar flow. Any, any other quick questions? Let's thank, thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.